Welcome to another broadcast from MindYourHealthCast.com. Now, if you will search back through your memory banks, you'll recall that the last broadcast, we started a part one of a broadcast relating to the Health, uh, health Hall of Fame. Uh, and by that I mean by the people who have really done a lot of significant pioneering work in the field of health and in many cases have uh, fallen by the wayside either because they were um, caused to have to relocate uh, from one country to another or have uh, been hounded and harassed until in many cases they expired. Uh, and in uh, some cases they just finally were old enough, they passed on to the next level, but they never got the hearing in general that they should have for the significance of what they presented. Now we're talking about that group versus another group called Merchants of Disaster, which is what really gained the foothold because they made all kinds of what I call wild promises that haven't been kept and the reason I say that is all you have to do is look at the status of the health of our country today and if you can say that it's better than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago or even 200 years ago uh, then I guess you haven't been paying attention. Uh, it seems that every year the health bill, which is really the sick bill, has gone up and up and people are getting sicker and sicker with more and more chronic illnesses. Now that should not be happening if what we were doing is making people healthier. But the fact is that is not the case um, and I think that you would be um, what would I say, really, really perplexed to try to produce evidence otherwise. Now, I've been around long enough to have observed a tremendous amount of change, not only in the health of our country, but in the methodologies that have been used to supposedly produce health. Now, what I'm going to do is, can't give you every name of every person who has contributed a significant amount of good information that does lead to health, um, but we're going to hit some of the top ones that come to mind to me uh, from my study of the last 200 years or so of medicine and uh, health. Now, first of all, out of all of this, I want to propose a hypothesis and uh, it ultimately is supported by all these different doctors and researchers that we have either made reference to already or will be referencing today. We'll try to move along at a pretty fast pace and set, that means that we're not going to be able to go into any great detail into some of these people other than to mention what the significant thing to me is that they contributed. However, it would be worthwhile to have your, as I mentioned last time, your pencil and paper or your pen and paper or whatever you like to use and to note some of these names and as far as I know, all of them, one place or another, either on the internet in general or through Amazon or um, some of the other, Barnes & Noble, the, the major uh, book outlets, you're going to find uh, most of these writings, especially the latter ones that we'll be talking about. But now you also remember that uh, the last time we were showing what I considered to be the unfolding of the modern approach to medicine um, based on two individuals and, and I'll recap that in a moment. But before we do that, and to be sure I get it in before we run out of time, I've kind of outlined basically how I see what has been happening and from my experience of 35 plus years of working with people with all kinds of health problems, the, uh, this is what I have arrived at and it's pretty much uh, attested to by the various individuals that I'll be talking about. Now many times some of these did not 
uh, deal with certain issues, there was it was not such a significant issue at the time, but since then has become a major issue. For example, uh, the amount of electromagnetic field exposure that we're getting today versus what we were getting 50 years ago or even 30 years ago is totally changed, but it still falls under the same major category as some of the things we'll be talking about, and so we'll fit that in. But otherwise, if you look back, and what I have found, and I've mentioned before, now a lot of this I've given you in pieces along the way, and uh, now I'm just wanting to recap it and bring it together so that it tends to make sense. Now I've, I've made up this little sign, I don't know how visible it is to you, but it starts out by saying, We're just adjusting this to see if you can see it okay. Okay, that's good? Okay. So, if you look at the top of it, it says soil deficiency yields or leads to food deficiency. Now, I mean, that doesn't take a genius mind to figure. If it's not in the soil, then food growing in the soil will not have it either. And of course, then food deficiency leads to nutritional deficiency. Now, that can be on different levels. Uh, one is, is plants that are grown in deficient soil uh, are not going to have all the mineral nutrients and so forth that they need to have. Or animals eating those plants grown in deficient soil are also not going to have all the things they need because the body requires a whole mix of all the um, trace elements, the major minerals, and so forth, not just vitamins. I mean, everybody talks a lot about vitamins and they're important. But the minerals are the cofactors uh, that not only help build the structure but that are um, either the core of certain molecules or help uh, the body synthesize enzymes, hormones, and many of the things that are needed so that it can work properly, including rebuilding and so forth. Now, the problem is that, as I mentioned before, it gets into this organic growing. I'm very much in favor and think it's important to grow things organically. However, if you grow organically, it only attests to how it was grown and not to the quality of the soil it was grown in. So if you organically grow a plant in deficient soil, you will still have a deficient plant. And we've been able to demonstrate that already and we've talked about the fact that there's ways to measure the um, mineral and nutrient content of a plant pretty rapidly and it doesn't cost you a fortune to get an instrument to do that, which is a refractometer. Now we're probably going to do, I did a lecture on it at my office, and we're probably going to do uh, either uh, one of the broadcasts in more detail and show you some of the things, or we may make the video available uh, so that you maybe can get that and, and learn at home uh, to do it in more detail. So at any rate, so if we have nutri all these nutritional deficiencies, which, and I'm talking primarily minerals, then that leads to deficiency symptoms. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but deficiency symptoms mean that because the body is missing certain elements, then certain processes cannot function right. Now, I've mentioned before that things like cardiovascular, uh, cancer, uh, neurological degeneration, diabetes, all these things was barely known in, at one time in this country, but now have become major issues, which really started late 1800, early 1900s. Okay, so now you have deficiency symptoms. A lot of the modern day medical treatment is the treating deficiency symptoms instead of correcting the deficiency. And everybody assumes, and when I say that I'm pretty much generalizing because everybody doesn't, there's people who don't, assumes that if you eat a, a good organic plant 
or even just a good plant in general that looks nice that you're going to get a lot of nutrients out of it. But that is not so and I was able to demonstrate that in my lecture uh, that if the soil doesn't have it and it's all out of balance you're not going to have it in your food. Okay so now nutritional deficiencies lead to deficiency symptoms which plus or minus adding stress to that leads to immunodeficiency. Okay, so that sets the stage for our body's ability to correct itself, to repair itself, uh, to take care of assaults from the environment uh, that may come from uh, toxic materials. And so Im immunodeficiency plus toxins leads to, quote, disease, acute and chronic. Now that's the basic hypothesis of all the stuff we're talking about. I'm giving you all these different people, but now I wanted you to kind of know where it is we're leading to so that we'll, by the time we get done you won't have missed that. Now the second one I have that I want to be sure you get is that now we talked about toxins and basically these are the toxins. Okay, so the first one is chemical, so we all know about it, whether we think about it or not. Those chemicals are the additives that are put in our food and water, uh, the chemicals that are released in the air from air from manufacturing processes. Uh, it is also pesticides, herbicides, uh, solvents, uh, things like thinners. I mean, it just goes on and on. All the chemicals, a high percentage of which have been uh, started from the middle of the 1900s and really is all over the place now. I mean we produce tons of that every year. They've done analysis, which I've mentioned before, of infants blood and found 150 in many cases of these various organic chemicals circulating in the blood of an infant. So we know that it's a major issue and they keep saying, well, this isn't really known to be toxic. However, they don't know over long range what happens, nor do they know what happens when you mix 100 or 200 in somebody's body. So that's one of the toxins. Second is ELF, electromagnetic fields. Um, that is, uh, there's, there's a huge amount of that going on. The like we have not known in our knowledge of the history of the earth that man has been exposed to so many of the electromagnetic fields. Also the vaccination started out way way back with one little vaccination and now we're up to dozens and one doctor that I mentioned recently in one of my broadcasts says oh you could take 10,000 it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, there's more and more evidence coming out. I know there's a documentary, documentary that's in process right now that's going to go into a lot of data that you just haven't heard before. Uh, fourth thing are medications. People taking all kinds of medications, especially suppressive medications that stop your body from doing certain things. Uh, it makes you feel better but it does not solve the problem. And then viruses are really cellular toxins. They get inside the cell and they can poison the cell. Basically, that's what it gets down to. And so it becomes one of those toxins. Now, the people who have a strong immune system, who are well nourished, those are not a major problem. But the people who have gone through the steps that we previously mentioned are now that in an immune suppressed state are the ones that are going to have all the problems. Uh, number six, emotions. The emotions are extremely toxic, and we'll be mentioning one of the pioneer researchers, uh, Candace Pert, uh, of Molecules of Emotion, uh, and she talks about toxic emotional molecules and what they can do to the body. And they can do go all over the body, settle in different organs, different places, and you can become very sick, i.e. Uh, degenerative diseases, cancer, etc. And number seven is metabolic byproducts. Now metabolic byproducts are those things that are left over from the cells making energy and rebuilding themselves and or dying off cells after they've replaced themselves and uh, begin to disintegrate. So all those become toxic things that the body needs to take care of and it can if it has the proper tools to do it. Basically means the proper 
nutrients and minerals and so forth. So we're not going to get into the specifics of those today, but other than to say, in my mind, this is what our big problem is today. And until we can correct that, there is no miracle drug, there's no miracle anything that's going to solve the problem until we can start building bodies that are healthy and have the capability of taking care of themselves. When we do, we are going to reduce the major sick bill in this country dramatically. Big problem though. That means that a lot of big, big companies who depend on us staying sick are going to suffer decreases or declines in a need or a market for their product. I don't think they're going to like it very well. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that there's a lot of fighting back as took place before in the early 1900s when it was becoming very evident that the problem I've just talked about was coming into play and some of the doctors were saying we can't do this, we have to get good food from good soil and they were silenced, they were pushed aside, nobody was interested in talking about them in the media. Um, it was rare that you could get any, any press for the good ideas of what used to be called natural hygiene or natural healthy living. And so now we've all been led to believe, we've been led up what I call uh, the, 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 the path of roses, um, that everything's going to be great, we just have to discover the right magic bullet, the right drug to shoot things out of us and everything will be great. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case it, and the evidence argues for just what I've said. People are sicker than ever with more serious illnesses than ever and they're starting younger in people's lives. Now, if you uh, want to see what can happen to more than one generation of people or animals who are deficient, and in particular the study was done with animals back along the way, and the book is called Pottinger's Cats. Uh, if you want to see what happens to about two to three generations of terrible diet, uh, what it can do to the health of cats, and of course the same thing happens with humans. And we're getting into that third generation now, and we have children being born with cancer or shortly after birth. We have uh, kids having their gallbladders out at 12, 13, and 14. We have heart attacks at 16, 17, and 18. And we have strokes at 19, 20, 21, 22. And now we're having an uh, outbreak of type 2 diabetes, which was an old age problem in kids 6 to 8 years old. Now something is not right. And if modern medicine that has cost us almost $3 trillion for a year uh, is doing his job, we wouldn't be there. But we're paying more and more money and getting less and less. People are getting sicker, sicker, and we're going downhill health-wise. At any rate, I want to mention some of the names of the people who have known about all these things all along and have done as much as they could. Uh, I think myself, I've noticed a new uh, air going on. Uh, more people are starting to wake up. It's a slow process. But sometimes I think it's like a tidal wave, you know, for a while it doesn't seem to be moving and then all of a sudden it just starts rolling with a lot of power and things happen. And so bit by bit I, I think there is an awakening occurring but it's very slow. But if you want to speed up your own knowledge, some of the people that I've talked about are ones that will kind of give you the background of all of this and give you an idea of what's been happening. Now, last time I mentioned that I see the development that moved modern medicine along very rapidly was the um, two gentlemen, uh, two, two, one was a doctor of medicine and trained in medicine and was a microbiologist and all that. The other was actually a chemist. Uh, the chemist was Louis Pasteur and the doctor, medical researcher, uh, that understood pathology as was known at least at that time, and now this is back in the 1800s. Uh, they, as much as was known about, about pathology was known by Ant Antoine Béchamp. He was the researcher that knew medicine and knew of what 
went on in the body, as I say, as much as was known at that time. Pasteur was actually a chemist, uh, and not to put him down because he was just a chemist, but there's a difference between being a chemist and being medically trained in microbiology and pathology and cellular metabolism and cell pathology and all those other things that are very important to know if you're going to really be able to do meaningful things in terms of research uh, for the body. So there was a conflict between the two of them. In fact, um, Pasteur has been given a tremendous amount of credit and I'm not saying he was stupid and I'm not saying that he didn't know anything. He knew a lot about what he was trained in, which was chemistry. Uh, primarily, also he had an artistic side. In fact, he had a degree in art. But at any rate, I feel from everything I can see that he was motivated to come up with something that would produce a lot of money and ultimately it led him in the direction he went and because he came up with the one germ, one illness concept, the medical establishment jumped right on it because it was easy to sell. Oh, well, the only reason you have a problem is because this bug has attacked you and all we have to do is to come up with a weapon to get rid of the bug and everything will be fine. And so they have operated on that hypothesis and if that hypothesis was accurate and is accurate, as I say, we would be tremendously healthier today. But are we healthier? Will you answer that yourself? Okay, so now it was those two that got this whole thing off the, the road. But now Bechamp, I read you from two different lists the difference between the two of those last time, but Bechamp said it was really the environment or the terrain of the body that was the problem uh, and the interior terrain of the cell. Those were where the problems were and so he uncovered this unit that he referred to as microzyma, which as I say it, it actually has been documented um, by a researcher that published in Scientific American a few years ago, I had run across the article, and he called them microbodies. And, and it, if you don't use a dark field microscope, the best way to find them was, as this particular researcher did, he used an ultra centrifuge, which means a centrifuge that runs at thousands of RPM and is able to separate into very fine layers the different constituents of, say, blood or a fluid or whatever, and that was the first time he had run across them, and he referred to, to them as microbodies. Uh, but he didn't really know what they did, except that they did have a modified uh, energy production cycle, like the Krebs cycle, but he wasn't sure what their value or purpose was, or if they even should be there. But what happened was that Bechamp found that they were there, and that they served a purpose. Now, later, a German researcher by the name of Gunther Enderlein, and that's one you want to uh, go a step further with. Now, he, he carried it a lot further. Uh, the tools that were used by uh, Bechamp were not as refined as the tools that became available later, and so Gunther Enderlein got into this heavily and showed that these microbodies or microzyma actually had some type of a life cycle and that they somehow participated in the body's health and illness. Now, Enderlein liked to think that that's actually what caused illnesses, that the terrain of the body became so poisonous that it caused these microbodies to um, mutate into a harmful form. I personally believe that they never mutate into a harmful form. What they do is they change their form as the environment they're living in changes and that they always participate in helping the body do what it needs to do. Now if the body finally is poisoned to death and is going to die, they mutate into a form that helps to break down the body and take it back to dust. Now, interestingly, these have been found in mummies' carcasses going all the way back to Egypt, and so I'm inclined to think that they always help the body do where, what it needs to do where it is at that point or stage of life. And if the person is, is now to the point they're going to pass on, 
then they help dispose of the body back to the ground because everything in nature has cycles and everything is taken care of whether it's a carcass in general, a full body, all the way down to uh, the constituency of the body itself, the cells uh, and various organs, everything goes back to the earth again and so I'm convinced that's what they do. Now as I say there is a school of thought that it's the microbodies themselves that become a problem but I'm inclined to think that doesn't fit with the, the whole picture as it has developed and as I've watched it and I'm always thinking that truth is consistent um, no matter what pieces of it are coming from where that they all fit together. Now there was another researcher more modern because Guther, Guth Gunther Enderlein is now expired also. He did write a book called The Hidden Killers was a, which was about his work uh, but a, a French researcher by the name of Gaston Nissens who li lives up in Sherbrooke Canada, um, he near Montreal, he has been there for many years and he has continued on with the research of trying to figure out the purpose of these. I will tell you one thing, I believe that they have a lot to do with genetic expression and even alteration of genetics and the reason I say this is that on one of the experiments that Gaston Neeson's carried out, he took a rabbit and he isolated these factors out of the blood of this rabbit and he injected them into another rabbit. Over a period of time the second rabbit began to change physically to look more like the first rabbit. Then he the, took some tissue from the first rabbit and grafted it into the second rabbit which was accepted which tells me that there was some type of a genetic shift went on. Anyhow Gaston Neeson's uh, has been harassed quite a bit and there's a book about him written by Dr. or, or by uh, Bird who wrote several of the other books uh, uh, that I told you The Secret to the Soil and uh, The Secrets of the Pyramid and so forth. Uh, he covered what happened to Gaston's and, and wrote this book called The Trial and Persecution of Gaston Neeson's. I have met Neeson's, I have uh, been to a major world conference on his work a very interesting individual and of course he's been harassed also because he came up with a product that's kind of helped people very inexpensively and without all the adverse effects to the body to get rid of certain types of cancers so of course immediately that puts him in big trouble especially since it's not a big expensive uh, product that costs thousands and thousands of dollars um, to either work or not work like some of the treatments do today. Okay, now I'm just going to put in some of the other people's names because I've grouped them according to areas that they seem to be significant in and I have read and studied all these various people about their work. Uh, one was a big one uh, from Austria, Dr. Rudolf Steiner, the developer of a branch of medicine called anthroposophical medicine which comes from the Greek word anthropos which is the Greek word for man. And so he developed a, a what he called a, an approach to medicine aimed at the man to actually correct the person. He's also the one who uh, developed um, the uh, biodynamic agriculture which is a way of growing. He developed ways of extracting herbs that did not require alcohol and that were very potent and lasted indefinitely. He developed the educational system that really worked to educate people he understood a lot of things about the world uh, and I personally could never figure out how he was able to work in all those areas and produce all those uh, writings that he did. But I'm uh, talking about him for the soil because that, that was one of the big ones was the biodynamic agriculture, how to grow high energy healthy food. Uh, Dr. Charles Northern is another one. I have mentioned him before. He's the one that uh, his uh, work was written by a journalist into an article which was read before the US Congress and in 1936 was actually published as a government um, publishing pamphlet about the effect of correcting the soil and correcting the food with good minerals and how it uh, was the answer to the health problems 
and of course you still can find it online if you look for it. The uh, mineral, it was called Modern Miracle Men, and uh, you can find a copy of it, and it was, as I say, it was published in 1936, I think it was June 1st, 1936, and Northern is the one that, it was a practicing doctor, realized that they weren't helping people with the drugs that were coming out, and uh, he decided to look deeper, found that the food was deficient and the soil was deficient, and when he corrected those, he found that people either got well if they were uh, sick or they stayed well if they were not sick. And his work got pushed aside. Um, doctors who were dispensing a lot of the pharmaceuticals and doing very well financially opposed what he was doing, and so you never hear about Dr. Northern, but if you can get hold of that pamphlet, or it was, it was like a small booklet, and read it, it will give you, this was back in 36, but the, he became aware in the 1920s that there was a big problem, and uh, the health was going down, down, and he was wondering why, and so that's what he uncovered. After him, there was a um, soil researcher by the name of Albrecht, William Albrecht, um, and came up with a way of testing the soil, and also Dr. Kerry Reams. Uh, I have studied heavily into both of those systems, in particular the Reams system, and came up with a simple way to test the soil and some pretty simple ways to make major corrections. Another biggie that has to do with toxins uh, was Dr. Herbert Sheldon. He was out of Texas um, and was heavy in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and he developed uh, what came out of the natural hygiene school of thought for health. And so he understood the concept of toxins. He understood it very well. In fact, when I've read through his material, it's exactly the same except not put into a nice chart form like later German doctor by the name of Dr. Hans Heinrich Reckeweg, and he called it homotoxicology. Uh, but he, if you read the two, you'll say, gee, they both understood how the body worked, they understood how you become toxic and how you get well by removing the toxins, by helping the body to do that. And then uh, with the deficiencies that were occurring, another name that comes to the forefront, which you're not likely to hear, is Dr. Royal Lee. He was a... Um, genius. He was an inventor, invented a lot of medical and dental things. He was trained in dentistry originally, but had a lot of background in biochemistry and health. And he started developing natural products made from organic plants growing in healthy soil. And he's the first one to come out with a good multiple vitamin. He called it Catalan. And he did a lot of other research that was extremely good uh, to bring this all together. And a lot of the doctors that really wanted to get people well uh, started using his products and his approach. And along the way, he developed something called the, back then, the endocardiograph, and also sometimes called the phonocardiograph, uh, which was before the electrocardiograph. And what it did, it measured the heart valves and the muscles in the heart and was able to demonstrate a relationship between heart function and the liver gallbladder, the kidneys, the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, and by running this test, which is a very simple test to measure those, you then could know how to put together a good health program for someone and you could, it could show that a product was really going to help a person because if you got a bad reading on one of the particular valves of the heart and you gave this person um, some of this product in their mouth for just about a minute or two and remeasured the valve, if it was going to be corrective for the person, it would actually change the reading on the, and the what then was called the endocardiograph, endocardiograph. Now they've come out with a new model called the Acoustic Cardiograph, or ACG, uh, which actually was developed by a um, instrument maker who made a lot of equipment for the space program. So he had, uh, and uh, health monitoring, uh, and so he was able to come up with a new instrument. So hardly anybody knows about it, and hardly anybody knows about the work of Lee, except a few people who utilize his products. 
Now from the deficiency side, I put Dr. Lee both uh, as doing something about it. He knew he wasn't able to correct the soil around the country. He knew he wasn't able to correct the food supply. So he knew people were going to have to take nutrients to supplement all of that. And that's, that's what put him in the foreground of the doctors who really contributed something significant for health. Now this Dr. Northern that I mentioned earlier, I could put him in that same group of handling the deficiency problems. Now when it comes to natural medicine, um, there's a lot of um, people that have contributed, but the one that really stands out to me um, was Dr. Christian Friedrich Samuel Hahnemann, who was a German doctor, um, very brilliant man. He uh, by the time he was a young man, he was fluent in about at least three or four languages, both reading and writing, as well as speaking. And then he went to medical school, was going to become a doctor when he saw what medicine was doing. This was in the late 1700s, early 1800s. He decided that he uh, didn't want to work with what they were doing. And so consequently, he made his living translating medical books. And in the process of translating a book on drug action, and back then the drugs were pretty crude and pretty, pretty nasty to the body, what few they had, and uh, he discovered a principle of what he called the similimum and the uh, minimum effective dose, and I think revolutionized the whole idea of treating and out of that came homeopathic medicine, of which of course a lot of people say is baloney, but with a lot of the new high-tech research because we've developed much more sensitive equipment, it now can be measured and I'll mention again a book that I've mentioned many times, but it's to me so significant that you really need to look at it. Now, the stress part I mentioned, the body-mind thing, uh, the people who really stand out in that are Dr. Wilhelm Reich and uh, very controversial. He was an MD, also a psychiatrist. Um, he followed Freud but, but kind of disagreed with what Freud was, uh, Freud was doing. Not to put Freud down, but Freud was really a researcher, not a therapist, but he did think that if you just talked about or uncovered what your bad problems were uh, in early life, that that somehow would make a correction, but it did not tend to do that very often. And so Reich developed a different approach because he realized that the body itself became involved in the problem, and that actually was one of the early people in what I call body-mind medicine, or the effects of stress, either one. And then there was Dr. Roger Callahan out of California who was a clinical psychologist about something called thought field therapy which has now become known as uh, energy medicine uh, or energy psychology. And also uh, we have out of that the emotional relief technique that was developed by one of the people who studied with Callahan. So I think Callahan is the real innovator and, but of course he built on the work of some other people which as happens in so many cases. I mentioned Dr. Candace Pert. She was the one who found out that all of these molecules of emotion go all over the body and carry information with it and that it can lead to significant problems in the body. And coming right behind that is a German doctor by the name of Dr. Rilke Geerd Hammer, who was a developer of what was just called the New Medicine and eventually German New Medicine. And he found that you know, unresolved emotional conflicts could actually change the physical structure of the brain and the part of the brain changed could then affect the related organ in the body. And so he was an oncologist, worked with all these people with cancer for years, a specialist in cancer, and he worked with about 40,000 patients over about 20 years and concluded that if he could uncover this uh, emotional conflictual issue that was unresolved, then the brain would change because he said the disturbance actually was visible on a CT scan and that he could see that and if the person could resolve the problem, the structure of the brain would change where that emotional conflict was causing a problem and the cancer related to that that had developed would disappear. 
So he was amply rewarded with that by being thrown in prison in uh, France for a couple of years or so without a trial until they finally were able to get him out of there. In the meantime, the Germany revoked his license because the pharmaceutical, especially cancer industry, knew that if what he was teaching ever caught on, it would be death to uh, millions of dollars of income, actually billions of dollars of income, but almost a million per patient. Uh, would be ruined if if what he uh, had uncovered were well known. So he, the last I heard, he was in exile in Iceland. Um, but anyhow, there are people who have been following. I have his the book he published, and I have a lot of information about his work and some other people who have, based on his work, had extremely good results with people with terrible chronic illnesses. And so that kind of brings me to one other that's involved with what I call the mind-body that is significant. His name is Dr. Ernest Rossi. He's a PhD, but he's heavy into hypnosis and hypnotherapy and has done tremendous things about how you could even change genetics uh, or the way genes express and do tremendous things in understanding um, how the body functions and to make corrections. So, any of his material is very good to read. Now we get down to what I call the modern research. And there's a lot of it out there, you just don't hear about it, but the one that really stands out right at the moment to me is a, an Italian MD by the name of Massimo Citro. And uh, he's written a book based on research that was done by a group of doctors that have formed a research organization. And so he wrote this book for the public called The Basic Code of the Universe, The Science of the Invisible in Physics, Medicine, and Spirituality. Now, what's happened is they have developed uh, and utilized equipment that can measure and prove beyond a doubt uh, of the mechanism of homeopathy and the fact that it does affect things and it does affect the carrier, the water or alcohol or whatever it's in, it has an effect. It's as though it gets recorded in that carrier and then releases the information energy that it's carrying in a person or an animal or whatever and they, they have the documentation that this works and how it works. So I think you will find it extremely fascinating to read through his book. I've mentioned it several times, but sometimes you hear about it and then it kind of slips out of your mind and you don't do anything about it. But this is one of the best. If you're inclined to really get into understanding um, the research and documentation from the realm of physics, and in particular it's quantum physics, uh, then there's a... Uh, a book written by Fred Allen Wolf, who is a quantum physicist, and it's called The Body Quantum, and he wrote one called, uh, uh, I'll have to think about it on that one, it has to do with the mind, and uh, how quantum physics works in the way, the way the mind works. Both of those are out of print, you probably have to look hard, but the, the body quantum shows how even the DNA involves something called quantum coupling, and uh, how by thought or intent you can alter that coupling, which means you can cause a disturbance to the DNA or potentially correct it. So his material is extremely good, and uh, his book on it's called Star Wave on Quantum Physics and the Mind. So very difficult one probably for the average person to read, but very interesting at the same time. The other tremendous researcher who's put out a lot of books recently, Wolf has a many out. I've mentioned him before, but I would look for, if you can find a copy of The Body Quantum, uh, it will really tie together how quantum physics affects the way your body functions, but it's all inter intertwined with your intent and your thought processes. And Dr. William Tiller, um, who is a, um, a physicist who has researched now, well, 30 years he did with the Stanford University in uh, California. He was a consultant to the federal government and was a researcher at the university, but then he carried on his own private research for 30 years, 
and when he retired from the university he has now continued to carry on some very advanced research and his first book that was for the public uh, was called Science and Human Transformation and it had to do with the uh, effects of intent on matter. Uh, the second follow-up one from that after he was out of the university setting and continued to do research is called uh, Conscious Acts of Creation which I think you will find very fascinating and he's written a couple others too uh, but just remember William Tiller not Teller. There's another physicist by the name of Teller who was a, one of the developers of the hydrogen bomb, but that's Teller, not Tiller. William Teller is very fascinating. His material is good both for scientists and non-scientists. If you read some of his material, of course, it's going to be um, uh, challenging for you to digest it at the beginning, but if you stay with it and catch on to what he's talking about, you can grasp the principles that he's documented by physics, quantum physics, and by the math of quantum physics to be accurate. So you'll find it fascinating if you're inclined to want to take the challenge. So I've given you enough information to get you going. Uh, these are some of the people that, as I say, are way or were way out ahead. Sheldon, um, he was harassed most of his life by the medical establishment because he was a naturopath and was in natural hygiene and they kept periodically if uh, he was getting too many patients well or of coming to him they would uh, medical people would make a complaint against him he would be arrested for practicing medicine without a license and of course at that time there were little, there were little or no licenses for naturopaths so he he worked under the title of a uh, natural hygienist, but nonetheless uh, he was harassed over and over. But he's a good person to read. It, it's written in such a way you can pretty well understand what he's talking about, about uh, toxins being a major issue. And as I'm saying, uh, it used to be it was mostly emotional toxins or uh, toxins from bad food or environment or whatever. Now there's much more environmental poisons and then, and then there's much more other things that are out there like the electromagnetic fields and so forth. So, But bottom line, the principle of toxins being the problem is still valid. So at any rate, I hope I've given you enough to challenge your thinking and uh, we'll see what else we can dredge up for another broadcast later. In the meantime, you uh, Dig up some of these and make your comments and you're free to challenge and or disagree or whatever with what I say and my, my comments are meant to provoke you to go and look for yourself and reach your own decision. Uh, if you, after doing all that, decide that you want to basically avail yourself of um, medical medicine, meaning using medications to manage your symptoms, uh, and you think that's a way that's going to give you the health you're looking for, then that's fine. That's, that's what America is all about. At any rate, uh, it was nice to be with you again. So remember, go to our website, mindyourhealthcast.com, and we are periodically putting new information on. And I was just reviewing it myself. There is a tremendous amount on there. If you go through all the pages that are on there, there's a lot of things to provoke your interest, depending on where you are and what's going on. In the meantime, until the next broadcast, be healthy.